about uh, 20 to 25 percent of breast cancers are HER2 positive. HER2 positive tend to be higher grade, more aggressive, um, and HER2, it's an epidermal growth factor receptor. For patients who have HER2 positive disease who are on treatment, treatment duration tends to vary whether you're thinking about the chemotherapy portion or the anti-HER2 portion. And about um, 10 to 15 percent of the patient, sometimes this biomarkers change, so that's the key. So let's just say if we have a, an ERP or HER2 positive patients or ERP or HER2 negative patients, sometimes when we repeat the biopsy, these markers change. Um, so that may help us in finding or uh, tailoring the treatment based upon um, uh, the new biomarker. Understanding that HER2 was a driver of a subset of metastatic breast cancer was practice changing because we had a target and we could develop drugs to that target. And that's led to really a transformational change in the lives of patients who have HER2 positive breast cancer. Trastuzumab is commonly used, but Tuzumab is commonly used in first line setting. So ataxane, Herceptin, uh, or Trastuzumab, and Pertuzumab, THP, that's a commonly used regimen in the first line setting. Second line setting, uh, based upon the Emilia trial, we use uh, TDM1, um, Trastuzumab, uh, uh, linked to DM1, which is a, um, a powerful microtubule disrupting agent. So TDM1 in the second line setting. And third line setting, uh, we use Lapatinib, that's another tyrosine kinase inhibitor, Lapatinib uh, with capecitabine or other agents. And then fourth and fifth line, we can continue to use Trastuzumab in combination with uh, uh, different chemo agents. You keep anti-HER2 therapy going virtually throughout the patient's course. So if they fail the first line of therapy with chemo and trastuzumab, you're going to use uh, some type of anti-HER2 therapy in the second line, the third line, the fourth line, and on and on. Now, at some point, um, you might drop it, but the, the general feeling is that you should continue the backbone of anti-HER2 therapy of one form or another, and now we have several choices. And, and change out the chemo and change out the anti-HER2 therapy, but not drop the anti-HER2 therapy for chemo alone. In neoadjuvant setting, we use trastuzumab and pertuzumab. Those are the two medicines we use in neoadjuvant setting. Um, adjuvant setting, we have some data, strong data with affinity, um, showed some um, uh, modest benefit of adding pertuzumab in adjuvant setting too. So adjuvant, neoadjuvant, those are the most, two most commonly used. But in extended adjuvant, that means uh, we use the trastuzumab for one year after completion of initial part of the chemotherapy. So we use uh, trastuzumab with the chemo then con con and complete that one year of uh, trastuzumab. So let's say we start a patient with a taxane, let's say docetaxel and trastuzumab and pertuzumab. And let's say this is a patient who finished their trastuzumab adjuvant therapy three years ago, so started standard therapy, which is reasonable in that setting. I'm gonna give about six cycles of docetaxel. Most patients can't tolerate very well more than six or eight cycles, and in fact, in the uh, uh, seminal clinical trial, that was the average amount of drug given, so that makes sense. So at that point, you stop the chemotherapy, but continue the anti-HER2 therapy. And the anti-HER2 therapy is basically continued indefinitely until the patient progresses. So I have patients who have been on trastuzumab and pertuzumab for 22, 31 cycles, you know, every three week cycles going on like that. And thankfully, anti-HER2 therapy by itself has very little toxicity. HER2-directed therapies are pretty well tolerated by the majority of our patients. We usually have to watch for any kind of cardiotoxicity issues. Um, with that, we monitor their cardiac fun function pretty regularly with either an echocardiogram or a MUGA scan every three to four months while they're on the therapy. Trastuzumab by itself has little toxicity outside of the cardiotoxicity, which is, as a single agent, relatively modest. We typically don't combine it in the metastatic setting with drugs that tend to be cardiotoxic like anthracyclines. Most of the other drugs we use are not particularly cardiotoxic. So watching patients on trastuzumab or for that matter any anti-HER2 therapy with echocardiograms or looking for the rare 
patient who might have clinical signs of congestive heart failure is important to do, but it doesn't happen frequently. Some of our agents can cause um, some gastrointestinal toxicities, such as diarrhea. So for those patients, we proactively medicate them um, to prevent the diarrhea or to minimize the amount of diarrhea that they are having with these agents. When you add trastuzumab and pertuzumab together, you do see more diarrhea, and particularly when you're using it with a drug like docetaxel. So that combination tends to cause more diarrhea, particularly early on. So the clinician has to be you know, paying attention to that and uh, making sure the patient has uh, appropriate supportive care for that. I will reach out to a patient initially when they're initially diagnosed with HER2 positive disease and I will educate the patient on their diagnosis their, and their treatment and how often they will be experiencing follow-ups with a nurse practitioner or a physician. At every visit um, the patient will see the, a physician or a nurse practitioner and then be in constant contact with the care coordinator in between that time frame. For patients who have failed trastuzumab early on in other words, they've either progressed through adjuvant setting, which would be a very aggressive, thankfully small subgroup of patients, or for patients that relapse within 6 to 12 months of completing their trastuzumab, plus or minus pertuzumab. We don't really have good data on that group yet. So whether that group should go right to TDM1, which I think is what I do and what many practitioners will do, or whether they should be rechallenged with trastuzumab and pertuzumab. Obviously, the answer is for them to go on a clinical trial, but if one does not exist, uh, then I think one of those strategies is reasonable. So TDM1, which is a really a fascinating molecule, it's an antibody drug conjugate, or ADC. Uh, which is a new class of drug. So we have cytotoxic agent, we have targeted treatment, and this is an antibody drug. You know, so it's a targeted treatment plus a cytotoxic agent combined with a linker molecule. Um, so uh, the, the, uh, the antibody is trastuzumab and combined with the cytotoxic agent, which is metansin, combined with the linker molecule. So we can deliver uh, the highly uh, toxic um, uh, metansinoid drug into the HER2 positive cells uh, in this ADC, in this antibody drug conjugate. Lapatinib as a small molecule has some different toxicities. And the reason for that is lapatinib also has uh, anti-EGFR uh, activity as well. And we know that the epidermic growth factor causes, is found in the skin. Um, there's lots of it in the skin, epidermal growth factor, meaning it's skin growth factor. And so uh, almost as an on-target effect of drugs like lapatinib, you get skin rashes are very common. And also there is a toxicity of diarrhea again with lapatinib. So those are the two things you have to look for, not only for lapatinib, but the other small molecules that are being developed uh, that are anti-HER2 therapy as well. So in the extended adjuvant setting, uh, FDA recently approved neratinib um, uh, in that setting. So uh, neratinib, 240 milligram um, daily, which is a pill, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, which is a pill uh, for uh, one year. So that ha has shown that decrease in uh, recurrence and improvement in survival uh, in uh, HER2 positive breast cancer. The prognosis for HER2 positive breast cancer has become better and better. And we're now looking confidently, I can say to a patient that on average, I can expect you to live five years or more, maybe a decade, maybe more, because new drugs are being developed. So if you're diagnosed with metastatic HER2-positive breast cancer today, your median survival should be in excess of five to six years. To learn more about metastatic breast cancer, please visit the Metastatic Breast Cancer Center of Excellence at practiceupdate.com.